So we are now recording. It is June 24th, 2020. This is the Amherst Conservation Commission um, bi-weekly, basically bi-weekly meeting. Um, so the agenda has been distributed. The first item is update from myself, which I don't have any. Um, next item is report from Dave, and I do not see Dave. Nope, no Dave at this point. So, and just to let folks know, um, <clears throat> the first two items, so the, uh, the UMass dredging and then the Tofino NOIs are being continued. Uh, so we'll formally do that in a minute, um, but do you know when they're being continued to for both of those, Aaron? Um, so Tofino is requesting a continuation to the next meeting, which will be July 8th, and then UMass had requested a continuation to the first meeting in September. Sounds good. Okay, so with that, Aaron, the floor is yours. Okay. And if everybody can just mute. Uh, there's a little bit of feedback here. Sorry, this is a little confusing because I don't know. Can you guys see the PowerPoint? Can't see the PowerPoint, but we can see your screen, it appears. Okay, let me try this again. Next to something, something. Okay. <coughs> Is it not letting me try that? There we go. Okay. Yep. Can you see that now? Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. So, um, um, okay. So I sent the e signatures um, authorization that was. Um, uh, notarized and certified by the town clerk to the registry and um, we're still waiting for that recorded document to be returned to us so I've been in a holding pattern with some of our permits which has actually been a good thing because it's been so busy um, over the last couple months that um, I was I was pretty behind anyways on just getting them um, polished up so but the good news is this week I got like the five outstanding RDAs drafted and then Xavier mommy's working and then please and then um, <laughs> just grab him sorry about that <laughs> Well, we're definitely at quorum now, now that he's yeah, here. Yeah, I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh my God, are you kidding? It's fun. <clears throat> um, do not apologize, Aaron. Yeah, for real, do not. <laughs> yeah, no worries Mine will be running across the screen at any moment. <laughs> <laughs> you see my dog, up. like, yeah. come on. This is just, yeah. Okay. Um, so I caught up on the RDAs and then um, the NOIs are in process right now. Um, but as soon as the, that recording comes through, I can basically issue all of them. So that's wonderful. Um, I did send out a, an email package to the board with like a bunch of envelopes. I don't know if you guys have kind of steadily been receiving that and signing off on it and sending it to the next person. Yeah, I received that and sent it on to Jen. But I, I have I one a couple weeks that ago. I'm sitting on. Sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. I'll do it. How many signatures are on that? Do you, can I you can't, know? I can't remember. Okay. I can, I'll try to go check that at some point. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm just curious, like, if it's been to just about everybody or if it's, um. I haven't yeah. seen it. I haven't seen it at all. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, nor have I. Okay. I will send it to either Larry or Laura. <laughs> okay. It's, it's okay. Um, and and um, Leroy won't see that because that was a permit that was issued before he joined the board. So just as an FYI, um, but yes, that's wonderful. Um, I also um, met with um, Eversource. <laughs> Xavier, let go. 
thank you. I also met with Eversource um, at the Podic Conservation Area um, this past week. And I've been working with Dave Zomek to try to um, come up with a plan because the beavers have completely flooded out all of the trails there. And um, Eversource is doing some work across the street at the Podic substation. So um, trying to, they're, they're proposing to, um, in the next short while, um, basically, um, put in a permanent access road. And so they need to do some mitigation for that permanent access road. And then um, they're also, Eversource is also gonna be coming through the Conservation Commission um, with a maintenance project that basically goes through a right of way from South Amherst to North Amherst. And so they're gonna be looking for quite a bit of mitigation to do. And um, yeah, so I'm hoping that they'll work with us on um, taking care of some of the beaver issues, particularly because um, that beaver issue is right. It's actually flooding their right of way. And if it breaches, it's gonna be impacting their right of way. So really hoping that they'll kind of step up and, and take care of that. And then even potentially if, if the commission was open to the idea, one of the ideas I had was allowing them to do um, a replication at Podic. That way they don't have to keep replicating on that small little postage stamp lot that the substation is on. Um, and that would, I thought might be an interesting project to have kind of be like a public monitoring um, or the CONCOM could monitor it or I could monitor it or even I know Scott Jackson has his class um, come out and do um, some wetland delineation for a course he teaches so I don't know if he would be interested in in incorporating that in some way but those are a couple ideas that I threw out to Eversource to try to um, get them to take on that project. And Erin, with that work that they're doing, this is just maintenance along line type work? Yes, so they're doing, they're basically replacing all the structures along the line. Um, they've yeah. done, they did some um, systematic upgrades at a few locations throughout town previously, but now it's maintenance of, of basically all the poles. So all the other poles that they didn't upgrade. Okay. So that's um, what's going to be coming through soon. And I'm actually meeting on Friday with a representative from GZA about that. Um, I'm sorry, you mean the, um, I don't know the quite the right, the term, the transmission line, the big the big towers, not the distribution line. Actually, right, actually right, now, right now they're down by Groff Park and those are low lines. Those aren't the big ones. Um, so they do have an active order of conditions um, for some sort of systematic upgrades along the line, which include like putting in new anchors and replacing some larger poles, I believe. So that's an order of conditions that's currently active. And they've been um, working on that pretty much since I arrived, I think, um, or at least since, since um, late winter, they've been working on that. Um, but this is, will be a new order of conditions for new maintenance work. So, um, I've mentioned to them also the um, issue with beavers at the um, Pomeroy Court, um, where there, we've got that big beaver dam on conservation land. And then I've also talked with them about Amethyst Brook. Um, when I was out there in February, there was quite a bit of damage to the bank of Amethyst Brook from people walking along the edge of the stream. And I was thinking maybe they could do some replanting to restore the bank. but since spring has sprung that uh, and summer's here now that that bank has sort of naturally revegetated quite a bit so i'm not sure if that's going to be appropriate or not um but we're we're in discussions and i'm going to talk with dave later this week and um i'm going to touch base with them again next week to kind of see where that goes but just so that you guys know if they come forward with some mitigation it's all stuff i've been trying to tease out with them and um, get them to um, get on board with. It's, it's been a little challenging, so. Yeah, that all sounds great. And just a heads up, Aaron, Dave is on at this point. Oh, great, awesome. 
I don't know. Um, if Dave, Dave ha may have questions, I had tried to get Dave um, on board with that um, phone call, but it didn't work out because it was kind of a last minute thing that was set up. But, um, but they, it sounded quite a bit more positive after the last meeting. Uh, there, it's been kind of up and down with responsiveness of, of Eversource, but this time they sounded very positive about it. So. <clears throat> Yeah, it seems like that's been one of the things in the past with Eversource as well. They can be a little tough, but then eventually they usually come through. You have to twist mm -hmm. arms every now and then. But. Right, right, exactly. So Aaron, sorry, I'm a few minutes late here. Are they on board with the whole package? Um, <clears throat> so I, um, this time around had um, Melissa Green, who's a, a little bit more of a, sort of she's like a senior um, person at BSC as a um, as opposed to sort of the field staff and mm -hmm. she sounded quite a bit more um, I guess enthusiastic about it and also it sounded like she was open to discussing it with the project manager at Eversource and she had some ideas for how we could potentially um, uh, br bring it forward in such a way that Eversource might be more willing to take it on. Um, one of them, one of the big concerns they had was two years of monitoring. Um, and Dave, I don't know if you caught what I had mentioned about potentially doing like a wetland replication for the substation work on PODIC, and I don't know what your feelings are about that. Um, but that was one of the things we discussed. Like if they, if, if in exchange, if, the, if we allowed them to fill some wetlands on the substation property to put in their access road, and in exchange for that, they, and also, you know, because it's a safety issue for their line, if they remove the beavers on the Podic property, um, whether the commission would consider allowing a wetland replication to be created on the Podic property in an appropriate location based on, you know, soils, hydrology, and also, you know, sort of our grand plan with the, with the site. But, um, and then the idea would be that the, the town or the conservation commission or maybe volunteers would monitor the success of the replication area. So that was kind of the discussion that we had and what they seem to be thinking might be feasible. Hmm. No, I, that definitely sounds interesting to me and, and I hope to the commission members. Um, yeah, we don't have to go into great deal tonight, great deal of detail tonight, but happy to catch up with you later on the week on that, Aaron. Okay. Um, I do know that, you know, on the on the western portion of Zala, the land we just purchased, and so this would be west of the substation across 116. Um, we are doing, I've been doing work there with the state for probably 25 years on Eastern Spadefoot Toad. And mm. one of the things we're finding is that um, there is definitely, you know, a limiting factor for the Eastern Spadefoot Toad is, is uh, breeding pools. So one of the first things I thought of was, would Eversource be interested in, you know, in building a vernal pool out on the Zala property um, in an appropriate location? Um, I actually had suggested that um, you do. as a possibility to them, and they seemed on board with it. So I'm so glad that you said that, because that was exactly kind of the same vein of what I was thinking. Are you a mind reader, or did we talk about that? I think we just got that the symbiosis going on. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, that's awesome. Okay. So there's some real potential there. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. I think that'd be great if we could make that happen. Um, so any more discussion on that before I move on to the next item? Okay. Um, so Eversource completed their um, work at the Pine Grove. Um, it was an emergency certification that was issued because there was a shorting transformer and a shorting 
condu uh, underground conduit and they completed the work and stabilized. So they just sent me some photos of the completed stabilization and the seed coming in. So just so that you guys could see that, I thought that looks good. Um, the check came in for the State, State Street restoration. Um, so um, Dave is going to be putting that into a special account that we can use um, for um, the restoration plantings on State Street. Um, I wanted to just give a shout out to uh, Kathy Keene um, on the second floor because she helped me enter like 10 <laughs> outstanding applications into Munis that I have not had an opportunity to enter and help me process checks and close out a batch that I'd been sitting on for quite a while. And um, so thank you so much, Kathy. And I just wanted to make sure the commission was aware that she had really, really helped me quite a bit. Um, Jason Skeels had reached out to me um, to let me know that um, at Groff Park, the contractor is demobilizing. So he said that the areas were stable and they're taking down erosion controls. I'm going to try to get out there this week and take a look at that. Um, but just so that you guys know um, that that site should be kind of wrapping up. That means that the water park is done at this point? Odd timing, but... I think that that's what that means. Um, we're, we're getting there. Um, we're going to open the, the uh, new amenities there in phases. So the first phase will be, um, will be the, the playground. And then probably a couple weeks later will be the spray park. So I think probably in 10, 12 days, we'll open the playground. So that means all the fencing comes down and, and then we're, we're putting the final touches on the, uh, the contractors putting the final touches on the, uh, the spray park features. So we'll, we're, we're real close now. Um, the other item I just wanted to put a bug in you guys ear about because it's the first extension that, um, I think it's the first permit extension I've received since I've been with the town. It was for um, Peter Hieronymus at um, 750 West Street. And it was a little bit of a, it was a little confusing because he had never recorded his original order. And so even though the extension, the previous extension had been signed, um, we were still waiting on a book, book and page number. So I worked with Beth to track everything down. Peter recorded his original order, recorded his extension, and it's due to expire on July 18th. So on the upcoming meeting, we will have a, we'll have that item up for discussion, but I wasn't sure how the commission typically handles extensions. If you guys want to do a site visit, um, I mean, I would ordinarily recommend that, but I don't know what your typical sort of process is um, in Amherst with extension permits. Yeah, my recollection, uh, it's definitely been a little while. It's kind of on a, my recollection is that it's a little bit on a case by case basis, Aaron. So okay. this kind of depends on, you know, is, you know, if a site visit is warranted, sure, that makes sense. But if it's, you know, that may not be necessary. And I'm just trying to rack my head around what, se where 750 West is. I mean, that's that sing it's it's a just, single family it's, development it's, over it's on just, the. It's just beyond pump pot line. Going mm -hmm. south on, on 116, it's on the left-hand side, just beyond Potwine. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so I remember, yeah, it's a fairly large property. And I remember he was putting something in a while ago. So, I mean, if there was activity out there, then maybe. Mm -hmm. um, but if nothing's happened, I'm okay. So. Yeah, the, um, I don't think any work has taken place. I My primary concern would be the original permit was issued... Um, issued to the applicant on 2014. So it's been, um, you know, a good six years since the original permit was issued. So I didn't know if the commission might be concerned about wetland boundaries. And I think that there was a isolated pool being potentially filled as part of that permit. So 
Um, anyways, we if the commission would like a site visit, I can make sure to schedule one prior to our next meeting. Um, I would be happy to go out and take a look at it as well, just for the sake of, you know, efficiency. Um, take a look at it prior to the next meeting and give a recommendation if the board would prefer. Yeah, I mean, it would be nice for somebody to go out there and look at it. Um, again, I'd have to, I'll have to do a little research on my side. I think I know where we're talking about, so I'm okay, personally, but. Okay. I know, I know the house and the property. I'm just curious what the permit is for. I knew the people that have lived there. I knew the original Hieronymus's. Okay, I think it's for a um, single family house and driveway, if I remember correctly. Yeah, let me let me chime in. This is for a vacant piece of property. It used to be pasture. Now it's all grown up. It's been through the commission and various processes in Amherst for a number of years, as Aaron mentioned. Um, is it is it is it the north or south of the house? Is it, it the is, corner lot on Potwine? No, 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 no. It's it's south of Potwine. There's one. There's two houses, and then this wooded spot and this is a long uh, crushed stone driveway with a for sale sign I think. Uh, it, yeah I know where it is. Okay. It might be Jones. Yeah. So yeah. Mr. Hirana has bought it a number of years ago. He was proposing to build a house there. Um, he ended up not doing that. We actually looked at it for a dog park lo location. I thought it'd be a great dog park uh, set back in the woods there. Yeah. With virtually no neighbors. It's a big parcel. It's about yep. I say it's 11 or 14 acres but most of it is very wet. So there's room back there for one one or two houses, I think was what his delineation said. Um, so anyway, um, somebody's looking at it with a little more, uh, a more serious eye now. Yeah, and it's right across the street from the Hampshire farm. Right. If that's helpful for people, yeah. or yeah. just about, yeah. Um, so I think that's most of the stuff I had as far as um, my general reporting. There, there was no major things on the monitoring reports this week, just some um, sort of minor upkeep, um, minor maintenance stuff, but nothing, nothing major. Um, and yeah, just, just sort of the usual returning phone calls and getting out and doing site visits next week. So um, I would defer to Dave on his updates. Okay, um, just one thing real quick. Just, uh, we do have a couple people from the public who joined us. Um, so if there are people from the public who joined us for our 730 or our 740 items, so that's one for university dredging and then for Tofino NOIs, just to let you know that both of those are gonna be continued. Uh, we will talk about them very briefly, um, but there's not, the applicants are not likely here tonight. So Dave, floor is yours. Mike, microphone. Yeah, you need to unmute there, Dave. So it strikes me that, um, you know, Erin is going to cause me to up my game. She's got the PowerPoint. She's got the slides on everything. And, you know, she's making me look bad. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, just a couple of quick updates for everybody. Uh, there's a lot happening out there. And, you know, summer is upon us and, and warm weather. Um, so I'll start off with Buffer's Pond. I'm not sure if any of the commission members have been up to the pond in the last week, but we're, today is uh, day seven of coverage up there and it's going, I think, extremely well. We have um, support from parking enforcement in the police department. We have support from LSSC staff members. And then we were able to uh, pull some people in kind of underutilized positions right now due to COVID, frankly. And I think I mentioned this at our last meeting. So um, we have coverage there 10, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, we're a little less right now. We have four people per day, seven days a week. So two on the roads and then two meeting and greeting. And it's been going very well. We're doing social distancing on the beach. Uh, they're coordinating with Brad and Tyler from, from conservation. Um, and people seem really receptive. Uh, we've had, I've been up there every day, uh, sometimes twice a day, and I have not heard a negative comment. It, it has all been positive about the presence, about the interaction. We're trying to do uh, voluntary surveys with as many people as we can, uh, asking them, you know, kind of 
how they use the bond, when they use the bond. We're also asking just for our own information, where are they from? Are they Amherst residents or not? Um, last Saturday I was there early in the morning. I, was, I got there about 9.30 and the first two parties I approached, just saying hi and what we were up to. First party was from Arlington, Mass. And the, second, <laughs> and the second party was from Brattleboro, Vermont. So it was just kind of interesting. I was like, wow, that, those are long distances to travel to go to a little puffer's pond, a little mill pond. But anyway, a lot of people know the area. They have friends or relatives in the area. And with everybody staying local, more local due to COVID, I think, you know, Amherst is kind of a destination. The Valley is a destination and Puffers is free and, and the reputation gets out there. So um, I think it's going really well. We're going to have coverage. I think we're going to try to do this as long as we can this summer. And um, it's, I think we're going to learn a lot about how Puffers could be managed in a way that we avoid um, some of the pitfalls and some of the chaos and some of the overuse that we've seen in previous years. And again, we're not trying to uh, close it down or shut it down or anything like that. Um, but I think we're going to learn a lot. I, I, I said to somebody out there today when I was there about five o'clock, it, it feels more like a park-like environment now. Traffic is slowed down. Parking is organized. People are, I saw people um, rollerblading, uh, uh, skateboarding on State Street. I mean, there's room to do that now. And it, it feels, you know, it's not totally safe, but it feels much safer than it has in previous years. So um, I, I would not be surprised if I'm talking to you about some sort of parking pass system in the winter of 2021, because it would be great if we could generate some revenue and then have a, a steady income source for the pond in the future. So hey, Dave, can I? Oh, yeah. sorry. I just have a question that's related to Puffers, but is about, um, not Kiwanis, uh, Wentworth Farm. Is it yeah. possible, uh, yeah, off of Stanley Street? So, I mean, there's a there's a little sign about social distancing on the ball fields, um, but it's kind of tucked behind a boulder and you can't really see it. Um, and so I was there the other day and there were probably 20 people in the water really, really close to each other. Um, I'm wondering if it's possible to do more, at least more signage, just kind of that due diligence kind of deal around there. Um, I know Brad and Tyler, I'm sure are, are, their schedules are probably packed, but if they can, I don't, and if they'd be the people. Um, and then the only other thing that's kind of smaller, because I know Kestrel has a role in that, that specific area as well, um, but the, the path is getting overgrown and people are kind of going off to the sides a little bit more on it. Um, Which but path yeah, is this? The path that going towards the field from the bridge um, where you can swim in the water oh, yeah. from Stanley Street going up. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So Kestrel doesn't really, I mean, from a day to day, they don't have much of a role. Okay. Some years ago, um, I um, kind of um, agreed to put up their little signs because they have been so instrumental partners through the years. Yeah. So their signs appear on all of our trail signs as kind of a rah-rah Kestrel. But um, yeah, so, so uh, you're saying the trail, the trail too is getting kind of a um, Kind of thick there. Yeah, and, just the invasives are creeping in. That's all. Yeah, no, we could we could brush that back. Um, yeah, the we we call it jump bridge because so many young people jump off the bridge. There. I wasn't sure if I was allowed to call it that in public. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> jump bridge. I went with yeah. Family Street. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, that is kind of second on my list here. It's it's okay. Given COVID, given the heat, given you know where we're headed, it is. It is really a pretty popular spot. So let me let me take a look at that. It's it's close to my home. So I'll take a look at that this weekend and we'll kind of decide what to do there. And I I don't like to oversign. I, I think you kind of lose yeah. effectiveness, but I do think during this COVID summer we need to at least um, put the word out there and, and give people an opportunity to to be responsible with others. So um yeah, but that's a little disconcerting with like 20 people in that little area. Well, they, they were, it was mostly, I'm guessing, high school students. They were all, you know, who were finished with school. And I'm not saying that excuses it. I'm just saying like, if, you know, I'm, I'm guessing the situation was like, school's out. They're really excited. They've been cooped up. I mean, I understand it and it's not okay. Um, yeah. it's, it's kind of that both and. Yeah, at some point, honestly, we'll probably... Uh... Um, I, I would back into this slowly. We'll probably need to start um, testing the water there as well. Yeah. So anyway. Absolutely. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. I had a similar experience at Wentworth. I walked down there with my son and there was dozens of people and there was also drinking and stuff going on. Um, mm -hmm. This was like on a weeknight around like five or six. Um, yeah, and I can reach out to APD and ask them to, you know, just do a quick jump out of their car and, you know, particularly alcohol, alcohol and swimming really, you know, I was a lifeguard for many years. It, it doesn't mix well at all. That's yeah. it. Well, and I just felt was... like I've got to turn around and leave. Like I didn't even feel comfortable going down there with my son. I was like, oh. And Aaron, that's that same part where Anna's talking about, or is that on the big pond? Um, it's on the, it's where the bridge is. Yeah. 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 I've had the same experience. I mean, it used to be pretty quiet, but now I wouldn't take Sophie there. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I literally told my son, honey, we've got to turn around because I just didn't want to. Yeah, I'll take a look there for sure. Um, other things moving along, um, we are doing some early mowing. Um, Harvey Allen has been working a little bit with um, with Brad and Tyler, identifying fields where grassland birds are not nesting. So it's so dry. And frankly, in years past, we've been so far behind on mowing and keeping some of these early successional fields open that we started a little early this year in those fields that don't contain bobolinks and meadowlarks. Um, so they are mowing um, Atkins Flats right now, which we rarely get into because it is so wet down there in Lawrence Swamp. So Tyler has been making great strides down there. And then we're gonna slowly kind of work our way to some of the areas that we haven't gotten to in a number of years. So we'll keep going on that. Uh, we're putting in an order. We have some grant money and um, uh, grant money and CPA dollars. So we're putting in some money for new kiosks. I'd really one of my, you know, small small dreams is to get consistent signage uh, in kiosks and con consistent uh, trailhead uh, kiosks uh, in in strategic places all over town. So we've got an order in, or it should go in tomorrow for four new kiosks. One of them will be for. Um, the Fearing Brook project, which uh, Beth Wilson is helping me with um, and, and taking the lead on down there off of um, uh, Route 9. And that seems to be moving forward uh, quite well. Uh, we should probably have a great note, Aaron, maybe in one of the commission's meetings if they have a um, you know, later uh, agenda, it would be good to maybe have us um, zoom in and, and give us all an update on where that design is and what, what the construction schedule looks like because Beth has really been taking the lead on that. Um, but that's that's a really great project. And, you know, it's funny, you know, in my travels, I'm on Zoom meetings about stormwater. I'm on meetings about water quality. I'm on Zoom meetings about um, climate change. And, you know, that project of, of recreating a floodplain there along the Fearing Brook, it really hits so many different notes uh, on all of those. Um, and, and it is right upstream of um, uh, Jump Bridge. So improving the water quality in the Fearing Brook and uh, creating a more um, sustainable floodplain there makes all the sense in the world. Um, I will say just in the Fort River, I was fishing it, I don't know, maybe two weeks ago and had the great experience of seeing all the, um, uh, the lamprey, the lamprey reds, the, basically where they deposit their nests. And uh, in the section from um, Groff Park up. There's a number of reds and you know they're beautiful beautiful animals and it's it's fascinating to watch them uh, competing for the different uh, the best the best uh, places to deposit their eggs. So I know that some people find them a little disconcerting. I actually learned from a, a young man who had a net that you can actually eat them and he and his friend were there to harvest a couple and I was like okay that was news to me. I didn't know that anybody ate lampreys but there you go. Um, yeah, Dave, um, related to signage, I don't know if I want to ask, but what's happening with Bluebird Meadow? Um, Sorry. Those are on order. Those uh, signs are on order. Okay. Um, so yeah, I occasionally get um, updates from Carol Gray and, you know, we kind of said, go for it. Um, so she needs to, she wants to zero out that grant. I think we, you know, we all recognize that those those signs are have a lot of information, and uh, they may at some point be dated. So they will last as long as I think we all think they should last. 
Um, but uh, we'll, we'll go from there. So I expect probably in July or early August, the signs will be in and we'll figure out how to get them up and, and whatnot. They come, they actually come with a, a mounted system. So in that, that regard, it's good. It's not like a kiosk for everyone. So um, what else? Hickory Ridge Golf Course continues to move forward that acquisition. I've got some meetings later this week on it. Um, the course is officially closed. If you've driven by, they do have a maintenance worker in there who is, who is keeping it relatively uh, clear with some mowing. But it's kind of interesting. I want to spend a little time there this weekend. It's kind of interesting to see how nature takes over very quickly. Uh, when you let those greens go and you let, let those fairways go, um, boy, um, uh, that plant growth is, is impressive in that floodplain. So it, it, it kind of really has that kind of wilder meadow feel right now, which is kind of interesting. I mean, I'm sure the wildlife and the birds are, are loving it out there and no, no more herbicide and pesticide applications. So our goal is still to close later on this summer, and then we would embark probably in the winter on some sort of master planning process with you, with other boards and committees, looking at the conservation land, the frontage that we all know could potentially be for some other use. So um, we're gonna keep it, keep it moving forward. And the last you knew, Dave, um, it seems like the linchpin for that one is to, if they get their solar credits. But as far as you know, they're in that block that they're trying to get to and everything is a go. Yeah, they are in uh, the SMART program. They got their application in early enough. I think it all comes down to dollars and cents. Um, I, you know, I know Laura uh, knows a lot more than I do about uh, solar energy uh, production. and But I think they're looking for any sort of adders that they can get for various aspects of their project. We're also still dealing with um, just kind of um, uh, getting a full understanding of the 21E, any of the um, areas that might have um, had some modest spilling of gas or diesel or anything like that associated with a golf course that's been in one place for 50 years. That's pretty common. So um, we did some of that work and then, then the owners did, did further work on that. So it's coming along. It's, it's been slow, but um, steady. So What are they aiming at for putting in the panels? Uh, they would probably, we're probably talking fall of 21. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's it's going to be a while on the panels, but yeah. uh, I'm, you know, we would, again, just to remind everybody, we would buy the whole thing. We would then lease back 26 acres to, uh, to company X for solar and uh, the 20 to 40 year lease. So, uh, what else? Uh, just in a related matter, you know, dogs often come up. So um, Anna knows well, she's on the uh, dog park task force, but that project is progressing quite well and we are going to break ground, uh, I hope, in July. We're going to have uh, some sort of a groundbreaking with the, with the council and the task force. And, um, and uh, right now, the preliminary indications are that, are that there are no grasshopper sparrows nesting there this year. So once we confirm that, then we can start construction anytime that we're ready to go. We, we have DEPs okay and we'll get natural heritage green light from them. And we have all the money in the bank. So uh, we're ready to go. And again, that's not going to be, you know, it, it's not meant to, you know, um, uh, change anything we're doing on the conservation trails, but I do think it'll take some pressure off our trails around town. Um, so that would be nice. Um, and then as part of that project, um, the remainder, just a reminder, the remainder of the old landfill will get a conservation restriction. So the dog park is about an acre and a half but the remaining, call it 52, 53 acres, will be permanently protected as grassland bird habitat with a conservation restriction. So it's, it's a really neat project with a lot of different elements. Solar across the street at the new landfill, if you will, the north landfill, a dog park, a sledding hill, a, a, the rubber frost trail goes over it, and a conservation restriction for grassland birds. So even if grasshopper sparrows never nest there again, it'll be available for Meadowlarks, for Baba Lynx, Savannah Sparrows, Kestrels, etc. So, so anyway, I, I think it's a it's a neat project. So that's those are my five or six updates. Happy to take any questions if you have them. 
Great, thank you, Dave. And we still have about 10 minutes until our first um, agenda item that's not being continued, so. Anything for Dave? Yeah, a lot of great stuff. I'm trying to think if there's any other filler here, any other uh, updates? Uh, I mean, I did notice at Amethyst that people are, that somebody is trying to reroute around that dangerous section along the bank. I don't know if that's working, mm -hmm. but I did notice somebody's trying that. Yeah, I'm gonna be out with Brad and Tyler tomorrow. We have some field time and we're gonna visit Amethyst. Um, one, to look at the trail slash bridge issue, but two, to look at just kind of how we're gonna discontinue the um, the central location of the gardens and kind of gussy up that area a little bit um, as we put those gardens to to rest and and just let that area revegetate in there. So. It's, it's, as you were mentioning with the other place, Dave, it's revegetating pretty strongly yeah. right now. Yeah, I just don't know if if there, I haven't been in there in a while. Do we do we need to take out fence posts and get uh, yeah. wire? Wire is the key thing. Whenever they're mowing, they worry about metal, and so we want to get any stakes, any chicken chicken wire, anything like that, because that can really injure operators or the public or dogs, frankly. Yep, there's definitely some stuff in there that needs to get taken out, but. Yeah. So, um, anything. Dave, I don't know if you got the email I forwarded from Larry about Zoom transcribing. I don't know if any other boards or committees have used that to transcribe minutes from Zoom meetings. I did get the email. I I honestly don't know. You might speak with Angela up in the town manager's office. I, I don't okay. know. Okay. I just thought that would save us a ton of time. If we could do that, that'd be awesome. Mm -hmm. Um. I mean, I could give you guys kind of a, a quick update on what's coming through at the next meeting, um, if that's helpful as far as hearings. Sure, and then we need a few minutes just to do our continuations as well. So, yep. Yep, if yep. you wanna take a few minutes, that'd be great. Okay. Um, so, um, I don't know if you guys recall, um, there was a, um, I believe it was an RDA for um, East Leverett Road. And um, Brett, you were out on site with me. I'm trying to remember if there was any other commissioners out. I know you and I were there. Um, it was right where the, that really steep section of um, Cushman Brook was on the other side of the road. Oh, and we yeah. couldn't we couldn't go down there because it was snow on the ground. It wasn't really safe. Um, but there is a proposal coming before the board for a single family house. And um, I brought, I sent an email to Dave and to Brett um, with a bunch of questions about the application because uh, there's definitely some issues with the application. And I'll, I'll give you more detail on that at the um, next meeting. But uh, I have a meeting to talk with Peter LaBarbera, the consultant for that project, um, Friday or early next week to hash some of the issues out. Basically, they're they're proposing to alter like 76% of the riverfront area on the lot, which you're only supposed to alter like 10% or 5,000 square feet, whichever is greater. And their alternatives analysis was sort of in a narrative form as opposed to plan form exploring options for you know, reducing driveway or reducing house footprint or setting the house outside of the flood floodplain. So there's some issues that I need to work out with the consultant prior to the meeting, but just so you guys know, that'll be on the agenda. And then the other one is um, 227 Pomeroy Lane, a proposal to remove a tree and some saplings and then do some wildlife enhancement in the buffer zone to bordering vegetated wetlands. And, um, I think it's related to a sort of lo losing a view of the Holyoke Range over the years and so wanting to sort of reestablish that and in exchange for that doing some probably some pollinator habitat um, creation in the field. So those two items will be on the agenda as well as anything that's continued tonight. Thank you, Aaron. Okay, um, so why don't we go ahead and start with the continuations. Um, so the first two agenda items will be continued, but we need to formally go through there and see if there's any comments or anything we want to discuss about it. 
So the first one is our 730 item, which is for the dredging of Campus Pond at UMass. And we got a request from, I believe it was from Mickey asking for a continuation. I don't think it said exactly why though, Aaron, if I remember. Yeah, so they are putting together some um, designs to basically um, comply with a, histor a historic preservation group that um, raise some concerns. So they're, um, they're putting together some permits for like the Mass Historical Commission and, um, and then NEPA as well. Um, but they're, they're still outstanding on some of the permits that they need to get from Boston basically. Um, and so that's why they've requested a continuance to September to get those permits in hand. Okay, so that sounds fine on my part. Um, is there anybody here from the public who wanted to speak on this? I assume not, Paul. Um, do commissioners have any questions on this one? Um, are there any, is there anybody from the public who has any questions on this one? If you do, just raise your hand and uh, we'll switch your permission so you can speak. Okay. Um, so Aaron, do we have a date and a time that that would be moved to? Yes, yep, it would be um, September 9th at 7.30 p.m. Okay, so looking for a motion, a motion for continuation for this. I move to continue this to September 9th at seven, oh no, wait, what did you say? I'm sorry. Yep. Did you say a time? Sep, uh, September 9th at 7.30 p.m. At 7.30 p.m. So move to continue to September 9th at 7.30 p.m. I second. Okay, so need a roll call vote. So, uh, Laura? Aye. Anna? Aye. Larry? Aye. Jen? Aye. Leroy? You stay. So, okay, and Brett? Aye. So, continued until September 9th. Thank you. Okay, and so the next one are for um, all, the notice of intents for lots one, two, five, six, seven, and eight on Concord Way. And again, this was a request by the applicant for a postponement. Um, and so I think they just need some more time to get stuff together. Is that right, Aaron? Yes, um, they're saying that the transferring the vernal pool delineation to the original plan is taking longer than expected. There was also some other information that was requested from them as well. So I just, I figured they just need some additional time, administrative time to pull that stuff together. Okay, so any questions from the commission? Any questions or comments from the general public? Um, so, and again, when these get continued, sometimes they get continued multiple times, please get in touch with Erin and she can, you know, update you day of. Okay, so not hearing or seeing anything, looking for a motion and I apologize, Erin, if you said the time and day for that one. Um, it would be July 8th at um, 7.50 p.m. I move we continue the NOI hearings for Tofino Associates Inc. at Concord Way lots one, two, five, six, seven, and eight to the meeting on July 8th at 7.50 p.m. Second. Okay, Laura, how say ye? Abstain. Larry? Yes. Jen? Aye. Anna? Aye. Leroy? Abstain. So Brett, aye. Um, so we had two abstains there. But so we had one, two, three people, three people voted yes. Oh wait, no, do we have four vote yes? Okay, yeah, we have four voting yes, so we're good. Yep. Okay. I can count. <laughs> so. Okay, we are good. Okay, um, and just by magic, it is 7.50 by my clock. Um, okay, so this is a continuation of the abbreviated notice of resource area delineation for the Shootsbury Road property. And so for those people who are um, here as part of the application, if you could just raise your hand virtually, 
And then I will make you, or Aaron will make you a panelist. I got one person. Okay. So Maria and Renee, uh, I think we are good. Okay, so um, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourselves, um, giving us a brief update on what has happened since the last time we spoke, that'd be great. Um, and just as a reminder to the public who's here for this, we'll go through the commission and then after that, we'll ask for general comments as well. Um, so I'm Maria, I'm with TRC. We're representing the applicant in this case. So I think the last time we talked with you, the commission was on May 13th. Um, and since then, a bunch of things happened. We got an additional, um, we got an ex change order, I guess is what I'm looking for, um, on the peer review that Emily from Stockman Associates was doing. So that included an additional site visit and kind of a, a final review document. Um, so we completed that additional site visit and we updated the plans based on that. And on Monday of this week, Emily sent her comments and we made a couple of additional edits to the legend and notes, not the wetlands, just the legend and notes, and added the stamp to the plans and sent those late yesterday. Um, so I believe we're ready to close. I hope. I hope there aren't any more questions. Um, Emily's comments did not have any additional wetland edit suggestions. Um, and the other kind of major edit besides the wetlands is that at the last meeting we discussed uh, how to deal with the riverfront area because the river's completely off-site. So we did what we discussed at the meeting, which was to measure those points that we had GPSed for the mean annual high water line at the south end. And we used that width all the way up the river and estimated the riverfront area based on that. So it's it's about as accurate as we can make it with the information and um, property access available to us. Thank you, Maria. So um, yeah, Aaron, do you have comments and would you mind giving sort of a brief summary of Emily's comments as well? I mean, she submitted a lot of them. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, my big question, I guess, to you and Maria, I've looked at them, but you know, have all of them been addressed is the big question. Uh, can, can I jump in really quickly? Sure. Um, the vast majority of the comments are that frankly, none of us are happy with the numbering system. And that is a product of that so many of the wetlands got combined. Um, so it's usually you end up with some oddness when you have some edits, but there were so many edits at this site that uh, that that happened. The actual flag numbers match what's in the field. Um, Emily's comment is a little unclear about this, but where she says that things don't match, um, what she's talking about is the wetland designation. So um, something that used to be wetland five might say W5-22 on it. The flag number is 22. Um, but that wetland has since been combined because of the edits into wetland three. So the flag numbers match the wetland designations that are in the field are old. In my conversations with Emily, because of the timeline that these things take, if anything even can come of this site in the future, they're going to have to refresh the flagging here. And when they refresh it, the wetland designations will be correct. Um, but it's it's such a big site that it's not something that we would typically do at this point in the process. It's something that you would typically require be done um, before construction can start. And we're not anywhere near construction on this because we're just talking about an ANRAD right now. 
Okay. Thank you, Maria. So, Erin? Yeah, so Emily's comments came in at 5 p.m. on Monday, um, and TRC's um, email responses and plan revisions came in um, electronically on Tuesday, and then the hard copies were delivered this afternoon, afternoon. Um, so I've had a chance to read through Emily's comments. I have not had a chance to review Emily's comments um, in conjunction with the information that was submitted by TRC. I just simply didn't have enough time. I don't work on Tuesdays, unfortunately, so I wasn't able to jump in and do that review prior to the meeting tonight because um, I was doing other meeting preparations. Um, what I will say is I've worked on a lot of ANRADs, uh, permitted a lot of ANRADs, and where sense can be made of the flagging um, on the plans, uh, and there can be some logical um, connection made to what's shown on the plans, to what's in the field, then um, I think, you know, I've always made a pretty reasonable um, recommendation to move forward as, um, because understandably things change when you're going out and you're, you're modifying things when you find additional wetlands and things. Based on my and, and again, I want to look at the plans because I haven't had a chance to do that yet, but just based on Emily's comments, the flagging issues are significant. The flagging issues of what's shown on the plans versus what's in the field, there's a lot of confusion between the two. Um, Emily goes through this in some detail here. Um, certain wetlands have multiple repeated flag numbers. Um, as, as Maria noted, some flags are marked with the wrong um, wetland number. Um, so I don't feel prepared as staff to make any kind of recommendation until I can really sift through Emily's comments and look at the plans and understand in a little more detail how the plans and the site differ. Um, if it's confusing out in the field, I would be very concerned. Um, whatever's shown on the plans should be what's in the field, in my personal opinion. If, if a flag number is shown on the plan, it should be representative of what's been flagged in the field. And it, it what, is. Okay. Emily, so Emily and I walked all of these flags and the connections that are shown on the plan are exactly what is in the field in terms of flag numbers. Those are the numbers that you're going to find there. And the flags are close enough that you can, in just about every single case, see the next flag from where you're standing. It is not confusing to find where things are. And, and what's shown on the plans is exactly what's represented in the field as far as the flag numbers? Yes. The flag numbers in the field match what's shown on the plans? Yes. So the, the okay. flags in the field, the, they have a number system on them. And part of the number system is the like wetland designation. So it might say W4 or W10. Um, and that's the piece of the flag that may not match what's on here because those designations changed over time. The last number on the flag is the flag number. And that is what is shown on these plans. And that's what matches in the field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, I could see that creating some confusion down the road, um, doing site it's, visits and things. I could, it, I could. It's not though. My my point is that these flags, because of the amount of time that's going to lapse between now and when you would need to do any kind of site visit, flag refreshment will need to happen. And at that time, we are more than happy to fix everything. But there is too and all much the field time involved in essentially reflagging 
the vast majority of this site that's okay and and all the flag locations are surveyed so that somebody could go out and find that surveyed point of where the flag was supposed to be on the plan versus i mean if if you're saying three years down the road um somebody comes forward and the flags in the field have expired and needs to be reflagged um those those points have been surveyed in the field so they could be reestablished easily yes. and accurately yes okay so <clears throat> that's that's great and that actually that settles a lot of confusion for me i would still like to be able to look at the plans and like with emily's document because i haven't had a chance to look at it it's just it's it was submitted at the very last minute so it's very difficult to go through and i don't want to rush this through but it's completely up to the board with your comfort level on this the other thing i would recommend is a document that responds to Emily's comments point by point as to how they were addressed and where they were addressed on the revised plans. That way the commission can kind of get a sense of, oh, this, this item was, you know, reconciled on the plans and taken care of, or this item still outstanding, or this information was submitted as requested, kind of, so that we could just kind of hatch them off as we go down the line on Emily's comments. We are happy to go through that list of comments now. So Aaron, um, yeah, so give us just a sec, Maria. Um, so Aaron, do you have any more sort of comments on, or any sort of feedback? So I hear what you're saying and yeah, I have, I had a chance to go through these, the materials from Emily, but that's as far as I got as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't have any more comments. Um, just that as staff, I would need more time to give a recommendation on it. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, yeah. So commissioners, I mean, so do you have comments or questions? Um, I think a response in writing to Emily's comments is appropriate in this case for documentation of the process, especially since it's been a pretty complex process. Yeah, I agree with that. I was thinking the same thing too, Jen. I agree, and I, I just want to echo, I was also not able to get through all of the materials in time for the meeting. Um, so I'm, I'm not as comfortable progressing without, also without the responses to the comments. Ditto for me. And also just to piggyback on that, yeah, without Aaron having time to kind of go through that, you know, that just gives me an extra level of comfort. And so, yeah, and Maria, I, I hear what you're saying. I, I appreciate that I'm, I'm sorry for interrupting. I appreciate all of that, which is why I've offered to go through each comment with everyone so that everyone is comfortable. But if everyone needed more time, um, that really should have been communicated to us before tonight's meeting so that we could have just requested a continuance. Well, we didn't know. I mean, we need more time to discuss this because we're not allowed to discuss this, Maria, outside of um, these meetings. So I'm not quite sure how that would have happened. Um, I know many commissioners that give their agents a heads up, hey, I haven't quite gotten through all of this. You know, it's, it's just a general, this is where I'm at. It's not a discussion of the material. It's just I haven't been able to get through it. And even coming from Erin, Erin could have sent me a message today saying that she needed more time before she'd be able to make a recommendation to her commission and that did not happen. Okay, I hear you, so. Okay, um, so it still doesn't really change where we are, so we will try to communicate better. Uh, I'm still not sure if we, there was much for us to do different this time, but. Well, I'd like the opportunity to go through the comments with you and just show you what's been done. So, okay. Since um, we're all here. So, okay, yep, that is fine, Maria. So, I mean, we're still gonna need them in writing, so that's gonna be easier to respond to, but if you'd like to go through one by one, uh, that's your prerogative. We were not told at any other meetings that you needed this in writing. We were only constantly told that you needed a plan. So, 
Well, we, we made it clear tonight, Maria. And again, we didn't get these materials in time, so we would not have had time to review everything. The plan set, as far as the wetland flags are concerned, was provided last week. Emily's comments came in this week, but the only edits to the plan set that had been made since last week's are literally to one page of the legend and some notes based on Emily's comments. Everything else has not changed. Um, so just with all due respect, I mean, we're waiting for our peer reviewer to take that plan and go in the field and confirm things. So it would have not really made sense for us to review that without having our peer reviewers comments at the same time to do a side by side comparison of the comments against the plan revision. She's, she's been in the field and her comments aside from discussing confusion over flag numbers because of how things ended up being combined. It, there is nowhere in this set of comments where she says that anything is represented incorrectly. Whereas previous comments had pointed out that there were particular areas that she wanted us to revision. Yeah, and Maria, I don't think that anybody is necessarily, you know, poking big holes in what's here right now. We're just asking for some additional time and some additional documentation is all. I feel a bit like we're, we're being dragged around here. I'm sorry that you feel that way, but that is not our intent. So, I mean, we're trying to be thorough and that's it. Um, I. I appreciate that. Your peer reviewer has been very thorough and mm -hmm. we have done the things that, that she asked us to do. Mm -hmm. And we are just, and we just need more time to digest and go through everything. So, and I, I hear you that you are tired of this process and that you would like us to close sooner rather than later. And I think you're hearing from us that we are not at that stage yet. I'm concerned that your asking for time is going to turn into that at the next meeting, all of a sudden, there's yet another thing that you want. So, I mean, it's and, and that's that that concern is is not that there can't possibly be something I you know, totally respect that people notice things. Um, I'm bringing that up because of the issues that I've discussed with respect to communication. Um, I, I feel like if the recommendation was that you were ultimately going to want a written response to the final comments, that that's something that could have been communicated quite some time ago, particularly at the last meeting that we were at where you said you were gonna want final comments from the peer reviewer we should have been told that you were going to also want a response from us in kind um, like that. That's just setting clear expectations. That's something that we get very standard. I'm not quite sure. Yeah, that's, that's a very standard, standard to have written response to a peer reviewer. Also, we're all volunteer members of the wetland commission with full time jobs. We don't, you know, if a plan set comes in on a Monday or Tuesday and we're meeting on Wednesday night, expectation of a detailed review is a lot, you know, so I, we do I our best to communicate that. with Aaron, but we are doing our due diligence to do our jobs as the Wetland Commission. So um, you need to respect our, our the, that we're doing the best we can here. I, I do respect that you're doing the best you can and that there's a lot going on right now and that things are even more complicated than they typically are for all of us. Um, I, I have to say that it took way more coordination than I ever expected to get these things stamped <laughs> because nobody is in the office these days or even in the same location. So I, I do appreciate that it's taking 
more time to do a lot of things. Um, well, you, my my point well, is that we you, we appreciate your patience and, and look forward to, to seeing your written responses um, to the peer review and look forward to picking this back up. Yeah, my, my comment is that, uh, am, I, am I active speaking? Yes. Okay, my comment is that uh, you gave us, or that she gave us this letter indicating the things and then you met with her and went through them and you seem to have an agreement between the two of you. We don't know that. You know, you, you say you can respond to it, but I think it's appropriate for you to respond to that thing in writing in terms of what the, the, the agreements that you think are actually there. So it's, it's also, I mean, it's helpful feedback for us to um, hear that it was not clearly communicated that we might want a response in writing. And, and so we can now take that into consideration moving forward to make sure that it's we are expressly clear that that is something we will probably want in the future. So thank you for that feedback and um, you know apologies that it was not expressly stated earlier and it's still something that we are going to need. Is there anything else that you feel you might need? I mean, obviously, Maria, as we go through here, I mean, if we see things, we're obviously going to raise those issues, but without going through them, we're not going to know that. Yes, we, but that's just standard. Um, I, I appreciate that. My question is, you have made a comment that you've been through a lot of ANRADs. I have too, just not, not with you specifically. Um, and every town I've dealt with has dealt with them a little differently. Um, so I am asking in your process, what other things do you want, mm -hmm. typically? I mean, typically with a plan revision, um, an applicant would respond to the reviewer's comments and say, on point number one, um, the issue with the post-processed submeter accuracy um, our points have been field surveyed and we have accurate points um, determined for each flag so that future reflagging can be done accurately according to the plans. And then item number two, um, the final revision date for the citation on the ORED has been revised, like kind of point by point going through each of the reviewers comment and saying this has been addressed, this has been addressed, this has been addressed, so that when we go through, we have a you know, a place to see, okay, this has been taken care of. That's what I would ordinarily receive from um, the applicant based on a peer reviewer's comments. Well, I, I did that in an abbreviated form in the email that I sent you, um, but I appreciate that it's easier when it's matched up to the specific comment. There, there are a lot of comments in here that are extremely similar. Um, so it's, it's going to be a lot of repetition. <laughs> and that's fine. I mean, we have copy and paste, so that's a quick and easy thing to do. Yeah. The reviews were very, um, very detailed. That is correct. Yeah, it doesn't, we're not asking for a paragraph explanation on each of the comments more just this was addressed and can be found in the notes of the revised plan or um, we have this information you know via survey or you know just an explanation of each so that we can be comfortable that each of the items has been taken care of and so that if it's somebody besides your group maria that comes here afterwards they have something that they can follow as well mm -hmm. So does that give you enough direction, Maria? Or are you looking for something else? As long as that's the only other thing that you typically require, um, I just want to make sure I have a, a full list of what I should be getting together. Um, I'd also like to know how much lead time you expect to need to review this.
Yeah, I mean, I can't speak for Aaron. I mean, for me, a week minimum would be reasonable. I mean, I tend to do all my reviews on the weekend before. So. That's, that's totally understandable and fair. I just want to make sure because I, it, you know, with, with respect to picking a continuance date, I want to make sure we pick something appropriate given the time that you need and the time that we need to put together what you're asking for. But the bigger issue is, is very often on Erin's side, just because she is a part-time employee with the town and her hours can be, you know, they're not consistent. It's not, you know, so many hours every day. And obviously there's plenty of other stuff that Erin needs to be working on as well. So I mean, from your perspective, Erin, is there sort of a ballpark? So like if the, if the meeting's on a Wednesday, having it by Friday afternoon or Monday morning would be useful. So I have, because, because usually Wednesdays, are my meeting prep day. So I might be out doing site visits or preparing materials for the meeting, um, you know, getting packets prepared for board members and things. So having like a day in advance of the meeting, a work day in advance of the meeting would be, because I'm only here Monday, Wednesday, Friday. As long as I have that one extra lead day, I should be fine for me. I would just say, you know, um, typically, and there are always exceptions to the rule, Erin gathers everything she has at the end of the week preceding the meeting and sends us a giant email with a share, access to a SharePoint site so we can download all the documents. I try to carve out time on the weekend to do that. So if Erin isn't getting it to Monday and then getting it to us Monday night or Tuesday, it's hard for commissioners to have time to give it a detailed read. Um, so would it be fair to say a week before? That way Erin can get it into the folder and to us by Friday? Roughly. It sounds like that's what the, the longest needed lead time is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if we get it later, we'll do our best to try and do what we can. But yeah, it's just uncertain. <sighs> oh, I thank you for taking the time to discuss all of this. I just, I really, I think we would all like this to <laughs> kind of, be done sooner rather than later. I'm sure you're tired of hearing about it too. So I just want to try to get you everything that you could need so that we don't hopefully end up in this situation again. Okay, thank you. Um, so are there, do you just want to provide stuff in writing, Maria, or did you want to talk through specific pieces at this point? Um, so the, there are several comments, a vast majority of the comments in here are about weird flagging. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to talk about those anymore. <laughs> um, there was several comments um, about the legend mm -hmm. and I don't know exactly what happened, but for some reason on the first page of the plan set, the last one or two words of everything on the legend went missing. Um, I don't know why that happened. It's been fixed. It was correct on the other sheets. So I do apologize about that. Um, Emily commented and, and we understand that you know, we, between being on site with Emily, what she saw and what we saw and all the various site visits, the, the vernal pools are functional vernal pools. So we've removed uh, the word potential from the legend with respect to the vernal pools. Um, she has a comment that the riverfront area still says estimated. It, it is always going to say estimated because of what we've discussed with respect to that we couldn't physically do it in the field because it's off property. Um, we did update one of the notes to reflect what we had discussed at the May 13th meeting um, about how to show the riverfront area and how it is being shown now. Um, we, with respect to the vernal pools, we did provide Aaron all of the photographs um, with all the information that you need to certify them should you wish to, um, but it's not required under the Wetlands Protection Act or your 
local ordinance for us to go through that process, but we feel that we've provided everything to make it possible if that's something that you want. Maria, did that include the Vernal Pool field observation forms? That is not a requirement and it's not something that we typically provide. Um, we have between all of these materials, you have the dates that people looked and you have all the necessary photos and you have all the coordinates. So that's something the board should be aware of. It was a recommendation that we request that and the photos were provided. Um, but again, if Emily, um, if Maria's asking us to tell her everything we would like, you know, for the next meeting, um, if that's something you guys feel strongly that you'd like to have for the vernal pools, then um, that's something to consider. And again, it's tough to know if there's anything else like that in these comments that Emily recommends that wasn't specifically, um, you know, completed, but that's one that jumped out at me. Our response to that is that it is not required that we fill those out under the WPA or your bylaw and therefore they should not be required of us. It's, it's not something that should be on our client's bill to have to do. I mean, my, I guess, response to that would be, um, you know, we're confirming the resource area boundaries and as part of that, stating whether it's a vernal pool or not and observations were made in the field by staff that determined that the pools were certifiable so it might not be noted in the wetland protection wetlands protection act but um something to consider the, for the board to consider that um whether that would be a vital piece of information to have in order to approve the resource area boundaries um, we did say in writing to Aaron that we are happy to accept a condition that the vernal pools be treated as though they are certified. Um, we just don't feel that we should have to put more materials together that are technically not required. And we have gone above and beyond to provide information that would make it possible for the commission if you so choose to certify them yourselves. Any commissioners have thoughts or feelings on that? I mean, it sounds like they're going to be treated as vernal pools. Well, so, ha has, has, the, ha has the term potential been removed from the plans? Yes. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. I mean, so what were the I'm additional... Very good with the fact, oh, I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm very good with the fact that they want to treat them as vernal pools. As long as we can hold to that, I'm, I'm good with it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, the, I mean, is there something that we're missing, Aaron, that getting them as certified versus listed on the map as vernal, is there some difference there? Um, so the difference is that, um, and this is my understanding of the process, is that vernal pools could only be certified by the landowner that or somebody who has permission of the landowner. And so we might have documentation um, in the form of photographs, but those vernal pooled field observation forms, um, you know, that's not something that like the commission could go out and fill out in order to certify the pools or that like an outside party, like a neighbor could go fill out to my knowledge and file with natural heritage. Um, in order for a vernal pool to be certified, it has to have the um, permission of the owner to do that. And, and that rule may have changed that that is based on what I, my previous knowledge of certification was. 
and the process of certification requiring the photos and the observation forms. But again, Aaron, what would be the difference between it just being listed as a vernal pool versus being certified as a vernal pool? Because certified vernal pools have special protection on, for natural heritage. If um, somebody was to come forward with a proposal to do work, there are specific requirements for um, review by Natural Heritage Endangered Species Program to require specific um, time of year restrictions and um, potential buffer zones around the vernal pools and things like that. And so while it may be treated as a vernal pool under our bylaw, having a 100 foot no touch, it's not necessarily gonna be treated the same way as a certified vernal pool would be treated by the Natural Heritage Endangered Species Program if work was proposed on the site. Um, to clarify that a bit more, um, this is not really about time of year restrictions and stuff. That's all something that you as commissioners have the ability to put as conditions whether natural heritage specifically recommends them as part of the process or not. Um, the difference here is that if you put a condition on the ORAD saying that they be treated as certified vernal pools, um, you can word the condition such that it has to be per your bylaw or and natural heritage, you can word it however you want to give them the maximum protection that you want them to have. Um, the difference is that certification is a permanent change to the property, whereas an ANRAD, an ORAD, when it gets issued, is a, a temporary agreement about where resources are. It only lasts for three years. Yeah, exactly. Um, so if things change. If, so so if, if that lapsed, then that would mean if five years from now somebody came forward with a proposal and this ANRAD lapsed, that those potential vernal pools would have zero protection as vernal pools. Oh, if someone came forward, you would still have this as, you know, we believe there was stuff here. And during the peer review, you would find if they were still viable or not. So right, we, but we, if we, we don't see it as an issue, but the, the difference is whether you are putting a restriction into perpetuity onto the property rather than um, just for three years for the, the duration of the ORAD. And, and we feel that the duration of the ORAD is appropriate in this case. We, we don't feel that it's fair to impose a permanent restriction on the property owner when they're willing to treat the vernal pools with the full protection status that they would have if they were officially certified. Well, only on but, a temporary basis. Though. Exactly. Yeah. Well, the, but if, if you had someone come through that wanted to do any work on this property after this lapsed, you would find the vernal pools again if they're actually long depending on the time of the year pools, they'd be um but you can require that the peer review be done during that time of year there are a lot of ways for you to ensure that they're being protected they yeah we, ha we have another permanent change to the property we had another project similar to this where it was like a winter time permit and then vernal pools were discovered later and um, it's really come back to bite the commission in terms of like having to work out issues with the landowners and the neighbors. Um, I mean, I would urge the commission in the case of the vernal pools to exercise jurisdiction over those vernal pools to the maximum extent in terms of getting permission from the landowner to get them certified because as Maria said, if, if, this, if the commission approves and they say, oh, we'll treat them as certified or we'll treat them as vernal pools. And then four years from now, when this ANRAD expires, they come back, we might be doing this review during a drought year when those vernal pools are dry. And so Aaron, what would be the process for certification? Well, I think we would need something in writing from the landowner 
giving granting the Conservation Commission permission to certify them. We might have the documents, but if we don't have the landowner's permission, then um, I don't believe we have a leg to stand on in terms of getting them certified. Um, also, the vernal pool observation forms are necessary. And if we had the landowner's permission, um, you know, we would need those probably filled out by um, a competent source in order to submit them with the photographs. Um, Emily was present when well, all the photographs were taken. So yep. like you, you certainly have someone available that you like to work with for that. Right. So that's kind of, that's exactly what I was thinking was if we had the landowner's permission to certify them. And then if Emily was willing to fill out the vernal pool observation forms, then that might be a way that the commission could work with this landowner to satisfy everyone. The landowner wouldn't have to pay for it, but we could still get the protection for those pools on a, you know, permanent, in, in a permanent manner. Because the point that you were bringing up, Maria, was more of a paperwork issue rather than a objections to the certification? That's correct. We, we feel that, you know, this is a very complicated site and it has taken a lot of effort and budget on everyone's part to verify where everything is um, and what everything is. And we are, are at the point where we can't really continue to increase that budget for this aspect of the project. Um, but we are more than happy to protect these pools for future work, et cetera. Um, and we've provided what, what you would need for documentation in order to be able to put it together. And so you'd also be able to get that letter that we would need from um, the applicant? Um, I do not know if we can get that specifically. That's something that I have to um, ask about. They, mm -hmm. they had another meeting to attend tonight, so they couldn't come to this with me. <laughs> sure. Um, Understood. So I, I can't speak on that. And I, it's been a while since I did any formal certification. So like Aaron, I'm not 100% sure if that's still a requirement, but it, it may be something that you need. Um, okay, so can we put that on your to-do list that you'll ask the applicant if they're willing and if they are to facilitate that letter? Um, I can certainly ask them. I'm not going to facilitate the letter because that takes a, a bunch of time that we don't have available to us. We're, we're already ending up with more than we thought was, was going on here. Um, it's a big complex process. Yep, project. Okay, but if you can at least get that, and then I guess it will be, Aaron, you would be able to request that letter or facilitate getting that letter, or how would that work? Um, so Maria's, I just, I just want to understand a little bit better. So um, Maria, are you suggesting that I reach out to the landowner to let them know that the commission is requesting permission to certify? And I mean, is that something you would prefer that I, I do directly? I can give them a heads up that you'd like to be able to do that, but with respect to formally getting permission, I think that the, that, that it might make more sense for you to do that because I don't know if you have a particular form or like what, what kind of thing you consider sufficient um, for documentation purposes for that. Okay, um, well, what I'll do is I'll reach out to Natural Heritage um, and find out if the landowner's permission is still required. I believe it is usually just like any per anything like a landowner's signature is required to move forward with it on their land. Um, but I'll just confirm that. It, it makes sense. I'm not saying that, that it won't be necessary. It makes a lot of sense specifically because it's a permanent change to their property. Um, but I just it's it's been a while so I don't know the specific requirement for it right now. And if there's a specific person I should speak to or email, 
Um, I mean, I'd be happy to do that. I'm just not sure who that would be. Maybe per, I, um, I can work on, on who to contact specifically for the applicant. Okay. Um, if you will do the coordination with natural heritage. Okay. Um, the, it might be that they need to sign off on the forms themselves. I'm not sure, but I'll look into it. Yeah, and before we go um, too much further, I mean, I have my opinions, but I just wanted to see other commissioners, how you're feeling on certification versus just on, just being listed on the plan. I feel much more comfortable with certification. I think there's no doubt the certification is a better route. I agree. Okay. Thank you. It's just hard via Zoom trying to figure out how people are feeling on some of this stuff. So I apologize for being a little too formal. Oh, no, don't be. It's the, the Zoom meetings are very interesting. <laughs> um, I, I think that we have exhausted the vernal pool discussion. <laughs> um, there, there are a couple of other items that Emily had asked about that were not related to the flagging. Um, one was a reminder to essentially check the isolated wetlands for the potential of qualifying as isolated land subject to flooding. Um, I did provide that to Aaron the same time as the vernal pool photos. Um, it, I provided calculations showing that none of the areas qualify. Um, one area, the, one of the vernal pools had a depth of, maximum depth of 16 inches, 15 or 16, I don't have it in front of me, um, but it's a, it's a very small pool, so it was well under the quarter acre foot that's required for volume. Um, the larger pools uh, had a maximum observed depth of only six inches, which is just technically the average depth needs to be at least six inches, but we calculated it anyway on the assumption that the whole thing was six inches deep, just to be conservative, and they were all shy of that area. The largest one was point one eight acre feet and it needs to be 0.25. So they're, they just are protected under your bylaw, but they're, they don't also qualify as isolated land subject to flooding. So we did address that. Um, and the last item is that I believe when Matt did some of his wetland adjustments that he took some additional data plots. We have not officially provided those. Um, in my conversations with Emily and, and frankly, my feeling, I don't typically take new data plots once a peer reviewer is involved, um, unless it's an area that we're not in agreement on so that there's a documentation of why we're not in agreement. In this case, uh, Emily and I are, are in agreement about where the edges of the resources are. So it's not something that either of us is contesting. Um, Could I ask a question? Sure. Um, on the BLSF, you had mentioned that you had estimated the depth of the pool or pools. Um, so were those um, BLSF calculations based on actual measurements of depth that were taken they're, they're in the field? not estimated. They, they were measured in the field and we used the deepest observed depth for the calculation to be conservative. Okay. And on average, when you were measuring the depth of the vernal pools, like how many places would you check the depth? I mean, like, would you kind of take measurements at various places to determine the deepest point, or would you just kind of visually say, hey, this looks like the deepest point and take a measurement there? Oh, we typically just look for the deepest point that we can find. Um, there's, there's not a set way of doing this. The, the one that had some actual depth to it is a very small pool, so it was very easy to find the other ones. 
um, just are not very deep. Um, Matt and Emily walked through them. They're, they're not. When, when you survey a vernal pool, you need to actually walk into the pool in order to reach the things that you need to reach and, and do right. the survey properly. So you get a feel for where the maximum depth is while you're doing that. Right. I was just, because you had made a comment that you had estimated that it was like a six inch depth. Uh, no, we assumed that the maximum observed depth was, we used the maximum depth instead of the average depth for the calculation to be conservative. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. So like okay. your okay. average depth might have been four and a half inches, but we went with six inches because we observed a six inch spot to be conservative. Okay. Um, All right. That that's that's good. That's a good thing. Thank um, you. The, so we, I was trying really hard to make these pools qualify, <laughs> and they just didn't. Okay, that that clarifies my that answers my question. Thank you. Sorry about the confusion on that. No worries. So Maria, are there other points that you want here? Um, then once you're done with this, I'll open up the commission. Then we'll go to the public. Uh, no, I, I believe that those were the main points outside of the, the flags. We fixed the legend and notes, and we provided the documentation for the vernal pools and the isolated land subject to flooding calculations. So I, I believe that we addressed the outstanding things. Yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so commissioners, do you have any comments at this point? Okay, so uh, we do have a few people from the general public who are joining us. So if you have a comment or question you'd like to make, um, just raise your hand and then. Oh, okay, so Tim. Uh, okay, Tim, you should be able to speak at this point. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I'm uh, Tim Lang, and I'm a resident of Shutesbury Road, 257 Shutesbury Road. And I'd just like to say that as an abutter to the project, I know I speak for myself, I hope I speak for others on the street. Um, we're very concerned that the wetlands assessment, when it is done, is that it, it's done thoroughly, it's done according to the highest standard, and that there are no ambiguities whatsoever. <laughs> and it would bother me if I thought that points on the map didn't match flags in the woods, didn't match um, comments in the, uh, in the report. And so I'm applauding the commission in sort of holding the line and making sure that things have been done absolutely according to the letter. So thank you, Tim. And yeah, there's no discrepancies that we're observing between what's on the map and what's in the comments. Again, we need some more time to go through that. Right. Um, and also this is one of the reasons that we do often rely on third party. And so, yeah, we, I think we had a very thorough third party review and I think it did provide some very useful information. So thank you, Tim. Okay, thank you. Is there anybody else from the general public who would like to make a comment? Okay, so not hearing um, anything. So I think what we we're talking about at this point, given the direction that we gave to Maria, again, Sorry if that was not clear ahead of time. Um, we will be asking for seeking continuation until, so January, I'm sorry, not January, <laughs> sorry, um, July, that's the J, um, July 8th at what time, Erin? Um, 7.55 p.m. And so Maria, how does that sit with you? Um, I'm just looking at the, the calendar really quickly. Which day is the yeah, July 4th yeah. holiday? Which day is the July 4th holiday? Uh, for, for me, it's the third. I think for my dad, it's the sixth. So I don't know what day you, you all have as it. <laughs> well, my concern is what Aaron's is. Um, Friday, 
is the holiday. So that federal that, that holiday is really Friday. Because of when she has to get you things. That's why I was right. asking this question. Yeah, that's a good point, Larry. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I would definitely, um, I mean, if you, if you could get it to us by, you know, early next week, that would, um, I could distribute it to the board and have a chance to review it. Um, but yeah, that's a good point. There's only, there's only two days next, next week. Right, right. Good point. So Maria, does that still work for you? I am going to do my utmost. I cannot guarantee that I will have an answer back from the applicant about willingness to certify vernal pools. Um, I will definitely reach out to them, but I, I can't guarantee their timeline. I should be able to get you the written responses um, though in that time frame. Mm -hmm. That sounds good. Thank you, Maria. Okay, so with that, uh, I think we are looking for a motion for continuation. July 8th at 7.55. So moved. <laughs> Wait, I think, I'm, can you guys hear me? Yes. Um, so I move that we continue the ANRAD hearing for um, Shootsbury Road to the meeting on July 8th at 7.55 p.m. Second. Okay, so let's all vote. So, Anna? Second. Oh. Aye. Oh. Sorry, sorry, aye. Larry? Aye. Jen? Aye. Laura? Aye. Leroy? Aye. Brett? Aye. So, okay, so we will virtually see you again on the 8th, Maria, so thank you. Thank you very much for discussing all those things with me tonight. And I'm also really sorry if my air conditioning system has been making a lot of noise. I have not heard it, so. Well, it's, it's been an issue on some other calls, so. <laughs> um, thanks again, and uh, everyone have a very happy 4th since I won't see you again until after sounds thank good. you you too all right bye bye good night <laughs> good night okay so i'm um, just freshening up our list here okay um so that is the last scheduled agenda item that we have for tonight um is there any miscellaneous business at this point, Aaron, that we should go through or Dave, anything else that we need to talk about? Um, the only item that was on my list was the, um, was the extension for Peter Hieronymus uh, for the next meeting. And then those two items uh, will need a site visit, those two new items that are coming before the board on July 8th, we'll need a site visit, but I will schedule those with you guys um, probably that the Wednesday morning of that meeting. Okay, sounds good. Right, Dave, right. Two, two quick things. One, um, while that was going on, I did look up on a couple of state websites and Aaron, you know, please reach out to Natural Heritage, but I don't think, I, I don't think you need landowner permission to certify a vernal pool. I think it can be done without it. Um, so we'll see, but I found that on a couple of um, websites that they, they suggest you have permission before you trespass, obviously, but mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's required on yeah. the form to certify. I believe that's true, Dave. I looked that up at one point as well. I think you're yeah. right. Hmm. Okay. Is, it, is it typical for a consultant to not automatically hand over the vernal pool observation forms? If, if, I, if I was going to guess, I'd guess she's running out of time. Oh, I got that. But if they're observed, I mean, if she has to complete the forms anyway. Well, it, you know, from, from projects I've worked on in the past, it's not something that folks always want to do. Um, 
Okay. Because it's, we usually get them. If they're trying to develop a property, then it doesn't always work to their benefit to do so. Yeah. Well, yeah, I don't, I don't know how much detail we want to go into this outside of that hearing, but you know, when you think about it, this is, I don't know if Coles is going to sell the property or lease the property. So, you know, many landowners think very long term. So if you're thinking long term, why would you want a permanent restriction? That's right. Well, if you're just going to lease for the next 20 to 30 years, that's going to run with the deed and restrict your property in perpetuity. So anyway. Yeah, I I'd, be su I'd be surprised if they'd let us do it. I mean, if they would do it voluntarily, I'd be surprised. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I was going to mention, and not that you all need one more thing to do or think about, but pre-COVID, you know, we did talk about um, getting out more with with me and with Brad and Tyler. So if if you all, you know, we had those conversations where I think I met with everybody. I think I finally did. Anna, did we finally meet or no? We didn't? Oh, my goodness. COVID uh, hit. We were supposed to meet on, like, the day everything shut down. Oh, wow. It's, I don't know. It's just, it's never going to happen, Dave. <laughs> There's a lot of exciting things going on out there in terms of land management. And I, you know, it might be a good summer if you or, you know, if you have children and want to bring them along, it's just informal and walking and talking and seeing what's going on and getting your feedback. So, you know, if people are looking for opportunities to get out there and, and um, you know, both learn a little bit more about the conservation areas we have, but also talk about future land management ideas. I do know once we get a little further along in the summer, we are going to turn our attention back to those land management plans, which really call for the commission to weigh in on, you know, everything from trails, additional trails, maintaining trails, um, uh, you know, uh, carbon se sequestration on some of our forested properties, um, early successional management, uh, how do we balance some of the, the user uh, conflicts we have with dog walking and, and beach going, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess what I'm offering is, you know, this summer, if we wanted to do some informal walk and talk, you know, uh, it could be fun to get out there and show you some of these properties and particularly some of the ones we've just acquired, like, you know, in the last couple of years, like um, uh, Zala, like uh, Epstein's Pond, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm just offering that. So Dave, I got to say that sounds great. My only issue would be sort of timing wise. And so for me on a weekend, I can't speak for anybody else. A weekend would be much more, would be, I'd be much more inclined for a weekend, weekdays. I still work sort of normal hours, which is weird. But yeah, I no, and I would, you know, I'm open to doing it, you know, on a Saturday morning or something, you know, depending on weather and heat and yeah. doing an hour and a half, you know, um, Good, it'd be a good exercise for all of us and also get out and see some areas and yeah. So yes, yeah, so that sounds great to me. Maybe I'll put out some dates later in the summer and if people are around, you can, you know, weigh in. Thank you, Dave. Yeah. Always looking for new conservation areas. I try to hit them all, but <laughs> not with your wisdom. So it'll be fun. Anything else, Dave? Let me, let me ask a, a, a procedural question. And, and this is partly because of the fact that sometimes we don't have a quorum kind of issue. It, it, today, when we, when we postponed the, uh, the Tofino one, mm -hmm. two people abstained. It's a procedural issue. I don't think Leroy has to abstain on that one because we weren't ruling anything. We were ruling on the ex of on passing. Now, I can see why Laura might be that abs you know, ex abstaining, but I didn't see that. This is, I'm just thinking forward in terms of issues in the future about things. I mean, if you can't vote on the whole thing, Larry, I'm not sure how you can even vote on sort of that continuation piece. That so I still, true, but, understand know, what you're saying because there's yeah. no content that we're voting on. Right, first. exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I, that was just, a, I wanted to raise that issue in terms of something that, you know, because we do have problems at times. Yeah. yeah. And, and my understanding of that is like, let's say, for example, we didn't have a quorum tonight and the meeting was canceled. I would be sitting here on Zoom announcing continuations to the next meeting. <laughs> um, and that that would be perfectly legal because you just have to announce a time and date certain. And I think we're just using an overabundance of caution to have a motion to continue um 
for hearings just in case there's ever an appeal or something, but that's my understanding. Because then there's also the piece that the continuation, it has to also be in, not that it's the applicant's prerogative, but it's supposed to be with their consultation as well. But again, if we don't have quorum, we don't have quorum. There's nothing you can do. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. So anything else? Not this turned out me. to be a little bit longer one. So thank you, Aaron. You did very well. So I thank feel you like guys. That it's going to be a shorter meeting is what made it happen. <laughs> <laughs> Who said I that? Who said in, that? In her email, she was like, "It's a light uh, agenda," and I was like, "Oh, no. <laughs> I'm gonna be there till 11. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. So, Jinx us again. Again. <laughs> so on that note, I am looking for a motion to, for closure, though. Uh, I motion to adjourn this meeting. I second that motion. So, Anna. Aye. Larry. Aye. Jen. Aye. Laura. Aye. Leroy? Leroy? Aye. Brett? Aye. We are now officially adjourned. So. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Bye, Bye everyone. everyone. Keep safe.